Morning, church. It's, uh, it's been a little gloomy the last few days, and the rain ruined my hair this morning, but we're going to be happy today anyway. So if you want to rise to your feet, we'll go ahead and start service. Well, Father, we, uh, we thank you for this time to, to gather before you, Lord, as a, as a family, Father God, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. And I just want to lift you in that this morning, Lord. In the name we pray. Amen.
Father, this morning, God. <clears throat> Father, we do. We do declare, Father, how great and awesome. Father, how amazing you are. Father, we're blessed, God. Father, we are blessed to be able to be in the presence of a king. God, a king that is like none other. Father, this morning, Lord, we just, God, we wanna just express our love and our gratitude Father, for who you are, God, what you've done for us. Father, we praise you in this place. We exalt your name. Father, as always, God, we declare, Lord, we declare that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, you are worthy of our praise. You're worthy. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your presence. God, we just... Father, we wanna learn and we wanna grow in your presence and in your word. God, that every day, every day we might be able to come close to exalting you in everything that we do. Father, I pray that this morning, God, you, you open our hearts. Father, let our, let our eyes see and our ears hear. Thank you this morning, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. <clears throat> oh, wonderful morning, wonderful presence. Um, before I get into the message, I just want to hit a couple announcements real quick and you know, I, man, the Lord is just really stirring in my heart this morning. Um, <clears throat> so for announcements, uh, we have an event happening. There's a slide. We have an event happening. It's not us. It's at the Hannah Boy Center, but we have a rep here. If you guys don't know, Joe works full-time at Hannah Boy Center, and this is uh, an event that he's putting on or that Hannah is putting on and he's part of, and so he wanted to make it available to the church. It's, it's open to everyone, uh, for a family to come and make uh, cookies, Easter cookies, whatever kind of cookies, but it's a, 
time for families to come together. And it, the, on the slide there, you see the date and the time. If you have questions, see Joe back there at the sound cabinet and uh, ask him uh, anything that you have. We want to, uh, we want to participate and support uh, what they're doing, but support Joe also. So uh, put that on your calendar. We also have uh, this week, we have Thursday night prayer, our once a month uh, prayer night at Jared and Gabby's. And so you'll want to connect with them if you want to, to come and get their address uh, down uh, towards Sonoma and come and participate in that Thursday night prayer. That's at seven o'clock. Uh, we also, I want to make everyone aware this month, uh, normally, it's in the middle of the month is when we do our, our communion potluck uh, in the fellowship hall. This month, we are fortunate that we will be celebrating Easter at the end of the month. So our communion potluck for this month will be on Easter. Uh, that's the last uh, Sunday of the month. So you can mark your calendars, bring uh, family, friends. Uh, and you all know that normally... Uh, on a normal Sunday, we have breakfast and coffee and fellowship over in the Mayflower Hall before church starts. So you're welcome to come over there from 9.30 to 10. But on the potluck, you're also welcome to stay and, and participate in that. And, uh, you know, good food, good people, good desserts. It's, it's a win-win, right? So come and, and, and then the last thing I want to mention is just for the ladies to put on their calendar for the ladies gathering. It's typically the last Saturday of the month. That is Easter weekend. And so um, you'll want to connect with Quinn. It may be happening Saturday the 23rd. She has the plans for that. So uh, Saturday the 23rd. So ladies, have that on your calendar um, that you are here the right Saturday morning for food, for fellowship, for a Bible study. Um, so that's it for the announcements for today, I think. Um, <clears throat> she'll correct me later if it's not. I'm going to open with a scripture today, and then I'll, I'll kind of start to kind of uh, tell you guys where I want to go, what God has been putting on my heart this week. 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, verse 23 says this, and he prayed, and I'll just... Uh, briefly say this is Solomon praying at the dedication of the temple. When the temple was finally built and it's ready to open up, he's praying at the dedication before they actually use the temple as a place of worship. And so this is how he opens his prayer. He says, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you. In all of heaven above, in earth below, you keep your covenant and show unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. This, this same declaration uh, was in our worship. I hope it was in our worship. It should be in our worship because that's what worship is. It's not about me. It's about you. Worship is recognizing the majesty of God and responding in appropriate manner. That's what, worship, that's what worship should be. Worship shouldn't be me laying my needs before you. There is a time and a place for that. We all have needs. We all have cares. We all have things. And God is a loving God, and he wants to participate in our life in those areas. But, but when it comes to worship, it's just a recognition God you are who you are, and you happen to sit on the only throne of the universe. This is who you are. And so he begins his prayer like this. And, but this last part of this, you show your unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. I'm going to talk about devotion today. Lord, put devotion on my heart uh, early in the week, and, and it, it, it took a lot of a lot of prayer, a lot of digging around in the scriptures to, and, and a lot of just getting before God. For God, what do you, 
where do you want to go with devotion? What is it about devotion that you want to talk about? Because devotion is a familiar term, and it should be a familiar term. First of all, if you are a believer in Jesus, devotion should be a familiar term to you. If you're a spouse, if you are married, devotion should be a very familiar term. You know what it is to be devoted to your wife, and you, and you should know what it is to be devoted to, to, to the Lord, your Savior. So I, I'm going to share some things about devotion. As I begin to dig into this, it took on a little bit different look than what I was expecting because most of us, most of us would re- relate devotion to commitment, and that's how we would describe it. Being devoted to something is just being totally committed to something. And as I begin to dig into the scriptures and, and look and see, okay, God, what do you call devotion? Because if you show your unfailing love to those who walk in wholehearted devotion, I want to know what devotion is and I want to walk in it because I want that unfailing love in every area of my life. So I need a right perspective of what devotion actually is. And it's like this in so many things. We, we think that we know what it means, but we don't really even go to God and say, God, what, what is your definition? Like, what do you mean when you say this? Because I have my own perspective, and, I, and I'm pretty good at doing my perspective, but maybe I, I'm, I'm seeing where I'm lacking in ways and areas, and so I want to get his perspective on this. And so, I really think that for each one of us, we need to be, personally, I need to be a person of devotion. As I dug in the scriptures, I found there were so many things that are literally attached to devotion. And, and, you, and I can say for me personally and for you, we need to be people of devotion because we need these things that are attached, things like happiness, goodness, hope, wisdom, salvation, freedom. And, I, and freedom kind of hit me in a way of like, what do you mean? wait a minute, freedom and devotion. If devotion is total commitment to something, then that's, to me, I mean, in my mind, in my carnal mind, that's like opposite of freedom. (laughs) If I'm totally committed to you, I'm not really free from you. But freedom is actually found in devotion. And in Psalm 119, I'm going to read kind of a passage of Scripture here to show you these things that are attached to devotion. This is just one passage of many in, in the Bible. In Psalm 119, verse 33, it says, uh, Teach me your decrees, O Lord, and watch, watch the devotion that's in the heart of David. I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will obey your instructions. I will put them into practice with all my heart. This is the heart of devotion. And then he says, make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. Give me eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Help me abandon my shameful ways. For your regulations are good. I long to obey your commandments. Renew my life with your goodness. Lord, give me your unfailing love. The salvation that you promised me. Then I can answer those who taught me, for I trust in your word. That's wisdom. Do not snatch your word from truth from me, for your regulations are my only hope. I will keep on obeying your instructions forever and ever. I will walk in freedom, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. All these things that I said are found in devotion. They're found in a heart that's motivated by devotion. Happiness, goodness, hope, wisdom, salvation, freedom. It's the description. It can be, and it should be, the description of my relationship with the Lord. It's also the description 
or should be the description of my relationship with my spouse. So if you're married, I hope that you listen well to the Holy Spirit today. If you're a believer, I hope that we listen well to the Holy Spirit today. If you're someone who is uh, not quite sure about the Lord yet, I hope we listen well to the Holy Spirit today because I believe that uh, unpacking this devotion, a heart motivated by devotion, uh, when we see what it does and how it affects me and impacts me, it should turn me to the Lord. It should heal the broken places in relationship. It should... It should it should cause your marriage, and I say marriage, I know not everyone in here is marriage, married. Marriage is the testimony of the, of the relationship between the father, the son, and the bride of Christ, the people. There is a natural uh, symbolic showing and testimony to the world of the relationship of Jesus and the bride, and that is husband and wife. And so if it will change my relationship, if devotion impacts and changes my relationship with Christ, then if you are married, it should, in fact, change your relationship with your spouse. It's not going to impact one and not impact the other. And so what is devotion? According to the scriptures, it's this Hebrew word, uh, I'll probably pronounce it wrong, but kerim, a rolling R that I can't ever do. <laughs> I think about it like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a basketball player. That's, it's, it's a real close uh, Hebrew word to his name, Kareem. But here's what it means. Here's the definition of this Hebrew word, accursed. Cursed for destruction. That's the primary definition. So how in the, how in the world do we get devotion? But here, let me continue with the definition. So it's accursed or cursed for destruction, dedicated or pointed to. It actually is one of, these, one of these Hebrew words, and not very many of these words actually do this, but they don't just have one meaning, but they mean the two extremes. So it's complete destruction. In fact, it's typically used in the Bible. It's used uh, for something that is appointed to destruction. So it's complete destruction, but there are a few times in the Bible, where devotion, this word devotion is used to say not appointed to destruction, but appointed to the extreme opposite. It's not a place where there's an appointment for a lukewarmness, an appointment for somewhere in the center. It represents, the word kareem represents the two very ends of the spectrum. Uh, an example of this would be, uh, well, so an example would be Jericho, the city of Jericho. Now Jericho was the town, and we all learned the song in Sunday school growing up, you know, the walls of Jericho, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down, right? And so as the children of Israel, the children of God, are coming into the promised land, Jericho is the very first city that they encounter. And, and God says, don't worry, march around the city seven times, it's totally... Uh, you know, this is a crazy game plan, but this is what I want you to do. Why, you know, march around the city seven times and, and blow the trumpet and the whole thing is going to collapse. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to burn it with fire and kill every living thing and consume the entire city, all of its spoils and everything. Consume it with fire. Complete and total destruction. And so that's what the children of Israel... Had. And so in the Bible, Jer Jericho is actually dedicated... Uh, appointed to total destruction, and it was devoted. It was devoted. 
It's this word. But out of that city, there was one woman who turned from the ways of the city to the fear of the Lord. She was a harlot, a prostitute. Her name was Rahab. But God delivered her out of that city and her family, and she became, uh, she became accepted and numbered in the children of God, completely forgiven, complete, and ends up in the lineage of Jesus. And this same word is used for her. Devoted. Devotion. It's the same word. It's the two far ends of the spectrum. So when David talks about when he's in this psalm that I read, I will keep on obeying your instructions forever and ever. And I'll walk in freedom for I have devoted myself to your commandments. This devotion this word, basically, it means this. Uh, to no end, no matter the cost, in the face of complete and utter destruction, I will wholly commit myself. So, so when we say devotion, well, it's just me, it means being committed to someone or being committed to something. I'm devoted to something. That's right. I'm not saying that we're wrong in that, but I want you to understand the, the gravity of it. It's being wholly devoted to something in the face of complete and utter destruction at all cost. That's what devotion is. God gives us some ingredients to devotion and living a life of devotion and and, and what I want you to know and to, uh, today is I give you just a, you know three quick ingredients to living a life devoted. This is, this is not a devotion that means, uh, and, and here's just where my mind goes as I was preparing this. I'm thinking, okay, does devoted mean that I can't? watch the Super Bowl and football season and, you know, every Sunday afternoon this is like my, my thing. Uh, and maybe you're thinking, okay, what is it in my life that I, uh, you know, I'm going to have to give up? Devotion has nothing to do with things in your life that someone would look at you and judge you by or, you know, criticize your, that has nothing to do with devotion. Devotion and the ingredients to devotion that God gives in the scriptures has nothing to to do with cutting certain things out of your life and all of a sudden this makes me devoted. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the motivation of the heart. So the three ingredients I'm going to give you that's found later in this prayer, I opened up with the scripture of Solomon praying to dedicate the temple. He also continues that prayer. And this prayer is like 20 or 30 verses long. I've I'm just going to hit a couple of verses that, that show us the ingredients to a devoted heart. And it's a motivation. It's not a, something that, that you do. It's a motivation of your heart. And that's what we're going to talk about. So, and I'm going to use the, uh, that, that prayer uh, to show us these ingredients. And I want, my heart is this, is that my life and my marriage is consumed by devotion and it's marked by the favor of God. Those things that I, that I read, happiness, goodness, hope, wisdom, salvation, freedom. That's what I want my life marked by. So to kin continue on with this prayer that Solomon was praying, he says in verse 27 of 1 Kings chapter 8, he says, but will God really live on earth? See, he's asking God, God, let your presence fill this temple. We built this, and at the time, it was the most, uh, it was the most expensive, it was the nicest, it was, it was the best building on the face of the earth. It is, it is the, the building. There is no building on the planet that measures up to this building, this temple. Everything is gold. Everything is the finest of fine massive, massive pillars 
not out of stone or something, but out of like bronze and all this, uh, you know, iron and stuff that at that time, huge, huge amounts of labor. Wood brought in ships and ships and ships of wood brought down from the northern region in, in uh, Lebanon and stuff like that, what would be modern day, you know, brought down, uh, you know, to build this building. It is the nicest building on the face of the planet. He's building it for a God who he recognizes the majesty of this God. And he's like, how am I supposed to build a building that is going to house the creator of the universe? But I'm going to give it my best shot. They, for like 40 years, they stored up gold to build this building, gold and silver. And so he's continuing to pray after he said, God, you're the God of the heavens. He says, but will God really live on earth? Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea. O oh Lord, my God, hear the cry and the prayer of your servant that your servant is making to you today. May you watch over this temple night and day, this place where you have said my name will be there. May you always hear the prayers I make toward this place. May you hear the humble and earnest request from me and your people Israel when we pray toward this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live. And, and when you hear, forgive. Now, just to remind you, this perspective that Solomon has when he says, will God really live on the earth? Why even the highest heavens can't contain you? See, there needs to be something. Every, you know, probably almost everyone in here would say, yeah, I'm a believer in Christ and I'm saved and, and, and he lives in me. Do you ever look at yourself like Solomon is looking at this? I mean, this took years and years and years and years to prepare and to build a temple that's the most beautiful place on the face of the planet. And he's saying, God, how in the world are you going to dwell here when the highest heavens can't contain you? And the Lord basically says, yeah, but I choose to dwell among you. And it, wouldn't that be the cry of our own heart? You, re, you begin to recognize the majesty of God, and then you question the sufficiency of yourself and saying, God, how are you? the creator of the universe, the God of all things, the one who sits on the throne, the one who everything answers, the one who holds everything into place and in operation just by the goodness of your hand. And you're going to live in me? You're going to dwell in me? Boy, devotion maybe should be the starting point. Maybe that should just be like the first step into Christianity instead of being a place where it's a, um, hey, everything's going to be okay and your life is going to get better and it's all going to be good and just, just, you know, just say you believe in Jesus and it's all going to be good from here. Maybe the first step into Christianity instead of being a watered down version is saying, is, is not recognizing or putting so much emphasis on how, how good your life is going to be. Maybe the first step should be on a reality check on how good our God actually is. And then adjusting my life according to his majesty, which would be in the face of total destruction, I'm devoted to the very end. Because how should it, I mean, how would I offer something less to this God? The first ingredient uh, of a devoted heart is uh, humility. Solomon, if you remember, is the wisest person to ever live. He had prayed and God granted him wisdom and said, there will be no one ever as wise as you. And so he's the wisest one that ever lives, and he recognizes and he honors the majesty of God, and he declares that if it ever looks as if there's been some sort of separation between him, the people, 
and God, and he just says, God, when you hear from heaven, forgive. I, I, because here's where I'm going to come to, like in my prayer and in my recognition of your majesty, is God, if there is, if it ever looks like there's a gap between you and me, I'm going to assume it's my, like, it's on me. This is my doing. I'm not even going to question your character in the situation. I'm just going to be like, God, uh, if that ever happens in the future, forgive me. Forgive me. In Philippians 2, verse 3, it says this, Be humble, thinking of others better than yourself. And so my question would be this, is how can you esteem others, maybe a spouse or a loved one, how can you esteem them better than yourself? This, the New Living Translation says, think of others better. And New King James would say, esteem others. How in the world are you going to esteem someone better than yourself when much of the time we don't un- esteem God better than ourselves? And you probably say, oh, I totally esteem God better than myself. I totally esteem him. And I'm saying, yeah, you do, and I do every single time that we doubt his plan for our life. Every single time that we blame him for something that's bad that's happening, are you esteeming him higher and better than yourself? Is that really what's happening? Every single time that we choose to live our way instead of living his way, his plan, his desire for our life, every single time that I get a derailed and and I go to do, I'm esteeming the creator of the universe less than me. How is it if I can't esteem him, if I can't live in a consistency of esteeming God better than myself, how in the world am I going to esteem a brother or a sister or a spouse who is probably as far from perfect as myself? How am I going to esteem them better? They have as many flaws as I do. How am I going to esteem them better if I can't esteem the perfect one who sits in majesty. Humility, a humble heart, not thinking lower of yourself. I've said this many times. I hope that we get this like anchored. Humility, humble heart is not thinking less of yourself. It's not It's not degrading yourself and having a low self-esteem. It's thinking appropriately about him. It's putting him on the throne of your life where he belongs. It's thinking higher of him. It's not thinking lower of you. I don't need to drag myself through the mud every single time that I step in it. I just need to recognize him for who he is. God, you're the faithful one who loves me and forgives me. And I'm esteeming him higher. And I'm walking in humility. And it has nothing to do with me condemning myself. That's not humility. In Isaiah 29, 19, it says this, the humble will be filled with fresh joy from the Lord every single time I step in it, make mistakes, I'm far from perfect, but a humble heart is going to be filled with joy, fresh joy for that moment every time. The second ingredient, I'm going to try and get through these kind of quickly, the second ingredient is repentance. Freedom and life are not attached to, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm going to step on some toes with this. I don't mean to. I just want to open our minds to, to a, a godly principle. Freedom and life are not attached to, I'm sorry. Your pride is. When I have the opportunity to say, will you forgive me? And I say, I'm sorry, instead of, will you forgive me? That is my pride trying to stay alive, instead of my humility taking up a resident in my heart. Like being, a, if I'm going to, you know, I'm with people and with the Lord. This is a practice. I mean, when our, Jaden and Jared, when they were little, we were teaching them when they were little. I'm sorry is not what we say in this house. We say, will you forgive me? I'm sorry is a coward's way out. It's an arrogant place to hold on to your pride and and be 
a, a coward to making yourself completely vulnerable. I don't mean to, like I said, I don't mean to step on your toes, but I'm just saying, here's something, just this little thing that will change your life. Because if you're willing to say, will you forgive me? And I surrender to your judgment. Like, forgive me or not. It's on your plate. The ball is in your court. You have the option. When you say, I can say I'm sorry. And then, I, hey, I'm clear. I'm done. But when you surrender it to someone else whom maybe you offended and done wrong. And maybe you didn't. Or did, at least didn't do it intentionally. But Either way, it's like, you know what? I don't really see where I did wrong, but I see where it hurt you. Will you forgive me? It's, it's a surrendering of yourself, even, even if it means like, hey, I, I didn't actually like step out of bounds. I didn't mean for you to take it that way. It's just a little habit, but... But here's what Solomon did in this prayer, in the dedication of the temple, six times he said, Lord, forgive us. Six times, forgive us for things that we've never even done. Forgive us for things that's yet to come. In the case that we do something, when we cry out to you in this temple, forgive us. He's not coming, hey, God, give us the strength to never make a mistake again. He's saying, when it happens, if it happens, how it happens, God, forgive us. Six times he's saying, forgive us, Lord, forgive us, Lord, forgive us, Lord. Why is this man on the face of the earth? Forgive me, God, of something I haven't even done. When was the last time you took up that stance with someone that you are in relationship with? Just forgive me. We're getting fixing to go on a road trip. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but forgive me in the case that I pass the rest stop and you have to go to the bathroom or about whatever. That was the story of Quinn and I for a lot of years. I hated to stop. And it was like, oh, there's a sign. All of a sudden I have to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, uh, we've only been driving 20 minutes. No, it wasn't that bad. But we'd be on a road trip to go see something, and there'd be like these historical spots, and, and I'd just be like, I'm going to the Grand Canyon. I don't know what all these spots are. I'm going to the Grand Canyon. That's where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get, be a people that, that are in a habit of repenting. Repenting, repentance, is what is attached to the life and freedom of the Lord. Not I'm sorry's. It's something simple, but it's what Solomon does in this dedication. He repents six times for things that they haven't even done while he's dedicating the, the most beautiful place on the planet to the most incredible God. I'm, I'm just, hey, putting it out here, God, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. First John chapter one verse eight says this: If we claim, uh, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in truth. See, <clears throat> let me say it like this: When we uh, when we think that we have no sin, or we think that we're we're good or we're right. And I would use the example of, like, even when you think you didn't do anything wrong. See, most of us want to, when we feel like we didn't do anything wrong, most of us want to justify ourselves and say, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. This is kind of on you. You're offended. Oh, it's too bad. Right? When we're, when we're right in our own eyes, the Bible, just Google that in your Bible app sometime. Right in your own eyes, wise in your own eyes, righteous in your own eyes, a whole bunch of verses will come up. When you're right in your own eyes, it's the evidence of pride. When you're when you're justifying yourself and you're like, hey, this is I'm right, you're wrong, instead of coming humbly with a repentant heart, hey, I don't know what I did, but I know this. 
there's, there's a gap here now. Forgive me. When we don't do that, see, when pride is resident in our bubble, uh, for us to grow, something has to pierce deeper than pride. I promise you, when, you're, when you justify yourself and you're righteous in your own eyes and you're, you're, you're right in your own eyes, whatever pierces to the depth deeper than the pride to cause you to grow will be very painful. But with humility and repentance, it doesn't need to pierce very deep and it will cause growth. But when pride is there, it has to go deeper than the pride to cause, to get into that, your bubble of self-righteousness to cause growth. That will hurt. That will be painful. That's not going to be pretty. You're not going to like that. But, but a heart of humility and repentance keeps those wounds not very deep and keeps me growing in, in, toward the Lord in his character and his nature. I prefer doing it like that. Now, I've had a lot of those piercings because I've had a lot of pride. And so it, it, it had to go deep and it had to hurt bad so that I could see there was a better way. Uh, so I'm saying don't do it like me. In uh, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 7 says this, Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. He, he, he's basically saying in being impressed with your own wisdom is evil. Just turn away from it. First King, okay, back to the Solomon's Prayer. He says this in verse 36, and honestly, I don't know that there's a slide for this uh, because I think I forgot it, but it says, uh, this is in the prayer of the dedication. He says, hear from heaven, forgive the sins of your servants. This is the last thing he says. Forgive the sins of your servant and your people, Israel. Teach us to follow the right path. Point number three is this, teachable. This is the third ingredient to devotion, humility, repentance, and teachable. We need to be a people that's teachable. God knows the way. He knows the plan. He, he makes no mistakes. Are we willing to have him teach us by him leading us? That means we are following. That means we're stepping where he wants us to step. We're staying where he wants us to stay. We're going where he wants us to go. Are we willing to be teachable? Because he has the knowledge and the wisdom. He has the plan. He has the destiny. He has the purpose. He has no mistakes. He has a perfect track record. Are we willing to, when, when I say teachable, that's basically, okay, God, take me by the hand and lead me wherever you want to go. Because I know this, and as soon as, as soon as I step off of the path that you're trying to take me on and I get into my own way, it's going to be somewhere less than perfect, I promise you. I'm not going to walk in perfection in a perfect path towards your purpose and destiny. So we have to be willing. When, when I say teachable, we have to be willing to be literally coordinated step by step. Where, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? When do you want me to do it? That makes us teachable, or is our way better, our views, our thoughts, our habits, our desires, our life? You don't need to be taught, right, if it's your choice. Hey, this is my choice. God gives me freedom, freedom, you know, will, freedom, choice. I don't need to be taught. Psalm 25, 5 says this, lead me to your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. He wants to teach you his ways, his wisdoms, his thoughts, his plans, his purpose. And he'll teach you to love like he loves. He'll teach you to forgive like he forgives. He will teach you to do all of these things. The last verse, worship team can come up. We'll close with a song. Psalm 143 verse 10 says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on firm footing. When we want to do it our way and say, God, you've, you know, you've taught me a lot over the years. I got it from here. Footing's not so firm. His ways 
His teaching, his leading keeps us solid. It keeps us humble. It keeps us repentant. It keeps us in a place recognizing his majesty, like his ways. And we know those verses, his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. That's awesome to recognize it. That's step one. That's humility. But do you also recognize that he wants to take his thoughts and his ways and show them to you? That takes repentance and teachability. I will be teachable. It's one thing to say, God, your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Well, of course they are. You're the creator. But you also want to show them to me. I've got to be teachable. Heavenly Father, I just lift up, God, today, this message, this people. Lord, because I believe that you want to change our lives. The biggest change is you coming and stepping in. That's huge. And God, maybe most of us here have stepped have taken that step. So what's the next step? God, is for you to not just be here and be present, but be Lord of this moment. To be Lord of every moment. Teach me your ways. Show me your path. Set my feet on solid ground. Lord, I, I love, I love the thought of eternity with you. But the turmoil and challenges of this life, I really need you. I need to do it your way. Help me, Jesus. Lord, I pray that as your people, as we close up and we're done and we go our own ways, Lord, for this week, God, I pray that you would teach us your ways, that you would show us your goodness, that our lives would be marked with the evidence of the favor of God. Lord, in the face of every challenge, every day, Whatever happens, God, I pray my life would, would carry the evidence of the creator of the universe, your goodness, your love, your wisdom, your compassion. God, I pray that we would carry evidence of your favor. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can, you can stand and we'll close with a song.
praise you and we thank you, God, and we pray that you'd be glorified in our lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you Wednesday for Bible study if you can make it.